start today in Romans chapter 11, verse 1. So please turn there with me. Romans chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul begins this verse by asking a question. Hath God cast away his people? And he answers it, God forbid, which is a way of answering it, no. Hath God cast away his people? Well, the answer to that question is no. Now, what we're going to see here is that God cast away unbelieving Israel, and thus unbelieving Israel is not his people. So the question that's posed there is, hath God cast away his people? The answer is no. Well, but how can that be? Because he cast away Israel. And the answer is, unbelieving Israel is not God's people. God's people is believing Israel. Look with me at Romans 9, verse 6. Romans chapter 9 and verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. So if someone is of Israelite descent, is that sufficient in God's eyes? The answer is no. God expects more than just genetics. He expects that people be believing to be considered his people. Get with me Acts chapter 22, verse 3. While you're turned there, I'll read Romans 11, 1 again. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. The answer is no. Paul then says, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So Acts chapter 22 and verse 3. Paul is giving his defense here in Acts chapter 22, and notice what he says. I am verily a man which am a Jew. Now notice the verb there, which am a Jew. Did Paul cease to be a Jew when he became part of the body of Christ? He didn't. Because he says in Acts 22, he doesn't say, I was a Jew, but now I'm part of the body of Christ. He says, I am a Jew. I am verily a man which am a Jew. Get 2 Corinthians 11, verse 22. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 22. Paul says, are they Hebrews? Notice, so am I, not so was I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. So again, I'll say this. Did Paul cease to be an Israelite? Did he cease to be a Hebrew? Did he cease to be the seed of Abraham when he became part of the body of Christ? And the answer obviously is no. Go back with me to Romans chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says at the latter part of that verse, For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul says he was still all of those things. Get with me Romans 10, verse 12. Romans chapter 10, verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. What that verse is saying is it's not saying there's no Jew and no Greek in the body of Christ. What it's saying is there is no difference in how God responds to them t today when they call upon him. In other words, Someone who is a Jew today or someone who is Greek today, that's being used in the sense of Gentile, how do they get saved today? The exact same way. They have to believe the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. 
They're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. There is no difference in how a Jew and a Gentile is saved today during the dispensation of grace. That's the point that's being made in Romans 10, 2, when, 10 12, when it says, for there is no difference between the Jew and Greek. It's not saying that people cease to be Jew or cease to be Greek. Get Galatians 3, 28. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And so some take that verse and say, well, look, in Christ Jesus, there's no such thing as male and female. There's no such thing as Jew and Greek. There's no such thing as bond or free. The point of that verse is to say that in the body of Christ, there is spiritual equality between male and female. There is spiritual equality between Jew and Greek. There is spiritual equality between bond and free. But does, for example, or let me put it, do, do the characteristics of male and female cease when someone gets saved? They don't. Nor do the characteristics of Jew and Greek cease once gets saved, nor does the characteristics of bond and, or, and free cease once one gets saved. Get Colossians 3, verse 11. The point I'm simply trying to make here is, is some will sometimes say, well, there is no Jew or Greek in the body of Christ. They're all the same. You're no longer a Gentile. You're now part of the body of Christ. You're no longer a Jew. You're now part of the body of Christ. That's just not what the verses are saying. Colossians 3.11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. And the idea there is that there is spiritual equality in the body of Christ. It's not that you cease to be any of those things or to have those characteristics. Go back with me to Romans 11. So Romans 11, verse 1, I say then, hath God cast away his people? The answer to that is no, because God did not cast away believing Israel. But what God did cast away is he cast away unbelieving Israel because unbelieving Israel is not his people. Paul then says at the end of verse, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul was still all of those things. Verse 2, God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. It's exactly what verse 1 was saying. God hasn't cast away his people. What? What is simply a, a way of saying no. In other words, what or know ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying. So let's deal with the first part of that verse. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Get with me Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. What verse 29 is talking about is God foreknew and predestinated the body of Christ. Now, what some will do with that passage is they will say that what God did is he predestinated people and he said, this person and this person and this person, God predestinated to be saved and he didn't predestinate that side of the room. So, sorry guys, you know, next time sit over here. That, that's just madness. It, it is just madness to say, given that Christ died for all men, he gave himself a ransom for all. God does not predestinate individual people to salvation. But what God did is he predestinated the body of Christ to be conformed to the image of his son. In other words... If you are a member of the body of Christ, you are going to participate in the rapture, the redemption of 
our body because you need to have a new body before God will allow you into heaven. Okay? So I'm just going to say it again and I'll move on here. God does not predestinate individual people to get saved and other people not to get saved. That is a, that is a wicked, cruel conception of God because God desires that all men be saved. But what happens is it is up to individuals whether or not they believe. Put it this way. If you don't believe the gospel, there is one person's fault for that. Who is it? It's you. And if you are listening to this and you haven't believed the gospel, that is very easy to fix. It's not that hard, right? Believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose again the third day. Trust the blood that he shed for you on the cross, and you can pass from unbelief to belief. So back to Romans 11:2. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What God cast away is he cast away unbelieving Israel, but God did not cast away believing Israel that is in the body of Christ. Look with me at Romans 11, verse 7. Romans 11 and verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. What that's saying is Israel, that's unbelieving Israel, has not obtained what it seeks, but the election has. And that's because the elect, believing Israel, was not cast away. The rest of Israel was blinded and cast away. Look with me at Romans 11, verse 2. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. That's a reference there to believing Israel. Watch ye not what Scripture saith of Elias. And Elias there is a reference to Elijah. How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, and we're going to see what he says in verse 3. Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. So keep Romans 11, but get 1 Kings 19, verse 14. 1 Kings 19 and verse 14. Whenever you see Scripture quoting another passage, it's always a good idea to look at that passage and read it and understand the context and understand what's going on. So we're going to look at 1 Kings 19 verse 14. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now let's just pause for a minute. Is the life of an Old Testament prophet difficult? It is. Because what happens repeatedly is Israel goes into unbelief and the vast majority of Israel is in unbelief. God raises up a prophet and says, your job is I want you to go to these folks that are in unbelief and I want you to tell them what they need to do to please me. Well, what typically happened when the Old Testament prophet goes to the mass of unbelieving Israel. Did the mass of unbelieving Israel typically say, you're right, glad you came along, appreciate this info? Sometimes, but a lot of the time not. The point that Elijah is making in 1 Kings 19 verse 4, I'll just read part of it. The children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. Well, that's not good thrown down thine altars. So in other words, the altars that were erected to the Lord, they destroyed them. And slain thy prophets with the sword. Well, that seems pretty bad. So things are, 
Israel is not in a good state at the time of 1 Kings 19, obviously. Now, notice what Elijah says at the end of the verse. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the point that Elijah is making is, I'm the last one, and now they're trying to kill me as part of their rebellion. So keep 1 Kings 19, but let's look at Romans 11, verse 4. Romans 11, verse 4. But what saith the answer of God unto him? So in verse 3, Elijah says something, and in verse 4, God answers. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men which have not bowed the knee to the image of of Baal. Now, just before we get 1 Kings 19, we're going to look at verse 18. But doesn't that remind you a little bit of Israel during the 70th week? That most of Israel goes into idolatry, worship of the beast, worship, worship of his image, but is there a small believing remnant in Israel that refuses to bow the knee to the image? And, and the answer is yes, that there is. Now notice with me 1 Kings 19, verse 18. What God answers Elijah here is he says this, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. The key thing to notice from this, what Elijah says in 1 Kings 19, 14, Romans 11, 3, is, Lord, Israel's forsaken thy covenant. I'm the only one that's left, and they're trying to kill me. And God's answer to that is, well, no, there's 7,000 more. One of the lessons there is this. If you go simply by what you see, do you always see everything accurately? Do you always understand who's who? Or put a different way, as we sit here and look at our vantage point, do we know where all of God's people on the earth are and what they're doing and who they are? And the answer is you don't. And so if you simply go by what you see, you will underestimate you won't fully appreciate what's going on. That's the point that God is making to Elijah when he's speaking to him. Go back with me to Romans 11, verse 5. What that tells you is there are more of God's people than you can perceive on the basis of sight. Before we look at, at, at Romans 11, 5, let me, let me put it this way. Who's the God of this world? Satan, right? And he's the father of lies, right? He sets the course to this world according to Ephesians 2.2. 2. So what he's going to do, this is just the reality of it, is he going to give an accurate representation, awareness of God's people and the number of God's people and what they're doing? Or is he going to give a false perception of that? And the, the re, what he'll do is he'll give a false perception because he wants to discourage God's people. Let me put it a different way. If you watch the news or social media, does it give you a complete and accurate understanding of what's going on earth? Does it cover the stories that are of most interest to God? No, it doesn't. Have you ever turned on the nightly news and it says, hey, a bunch of people got saved today. They don't report that. It is not in their, it's not something they care to do. And the fundamental reason they don't is who is it that sets the course for this world? Satan does. And so is he selective in what information he wants presented and what's not? That's why you can't believe the, the mass communication of the world. Who's ultimately inspiring it? The God of this world. That's just how it works. So Romans 11, verse 5. 
Verse 4 just made the point that God reserved to himself 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal. Now notice verse 5. Even so then at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. What verse 5 is saying is there's a believing remnant today in Israel just as there was in time past. It may be hard to see. Was it hard to see for Elijah? Yes, he didn't see it. So it may be hard to see, but there is always a believing remnant. That's just the way that it is. I'll make another observation on that before we go on. What people will often say about right division or mid-Acts dispensationalism is, well, it was invented in the 1800s. Darby and Schofield and some others, they invented it, and it, it didn't exist prior to that. It was just something people invented at that time. Well, the first thing to notice is if it's in the Word of God, it was never invented, right? You shouldn't believe right division because men teach it. You should believe it because the Scriptures clearly show it, right? And it doesn't matter who over time believed it or didn't believe it. That's totally irrelevant. If the Scriptures teach it, that's enough. But I want to make this further observation. If you read church history, is church history going to give you an accurate portrayal of what people believed in time past? Let me ask you this. If you, if you decided today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a book on the state of the church in America, the year 2024, and you go out and you interview the leading preachers in the largest churches, what would they say about right division if they said anything at all? One, they might not even mention it. And two, if they did, what would they say? Would they say, yes, they've got it right, but all the big churches, what we're doing is completely wrong, but they've got it right. You should really go make them the focus of your book. Is that what would happen? There's no chance that would happen, right? Well, let me ask you this. When people wrote church history, did they write it from their own perspective? And the answer is they did. And the people that were writing the books were not the people that were being burned at the stake. When Tyndall was burned at the stake, what was used to start the fire? His own writings. Because the people that killed him wanted to not only kill him, but they hated his translation. And so they burnt his translation with him. So do you think that history is going to accurately record what the actual church was doing? No, it doesn't. And it never ever will because Satan is the God of this world. The point being made here is that even at this present time, there's an election according to grace, whether you see it or not. You might not be able to see it. You might not be able to count it. You might not know that it exists. But can you know that it exists on the authority of faith in that verse? Yes, you can. That's just the way that it, that's just the way that it is. So notice this. At this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. What Paul's saying there is, is there a believing remnant in Israel during the dispensation of grace? And the answer to that is yes. So I'll give you two examples. Get Acts 17, verse 1. Acts chapter 17, verse 1. Acts chapter 17, verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, 
So he did this regularly. Went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. You may recall that when we looked at Romans 1.16, Paul said that he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So did Paul as a routine, regular matter when he would enter a city, go to the synagogue first? And the answer is yes, that's exactly what he did. Because the gospel of Christ is the power of salvation unto the Jew, just as it is unto the Greek. Now notice verse 4. And some of them did what? Believed. So were there, during Paul's ministry, Jews that believed? Was there a remnant in Israel according to the election of grace? There very clearly was. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. Get Acts 28, verse 17. In Acts 28, Paul is in Rome, and we're going to see here what he does when he's there. Acts 28, verse 17. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. Paul is essentially bound here. He, he's, he has if you read verse 16, And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. So did Paul have the ability to just go in the synagogue? No. So what did he do? He summoned the Jews to come see him. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I've committed nothing against the people... Or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And Paul's going to share some information with them. Just skip down with me to verse 24, if you would. And some believed the things which were spoken. That's the believing remnant right there. And some believed not. Acts 28, 24 is a good verse for the reality of the ministry. If you preach the gospel, I can pretty much guarantee you two things are going to happen. Some are going to believe, and some are going to believe not. Are you responsible when someone doesn't believe? No. Who's responsible when someone doesn't believe? They are. It's up to them. It's their choice. It's their soul. They're going to give account for their soul. So as, as people that preach the gospel, our obligation is to preach the gospel accurately, preach the gospel boldly, preach the gospel lovingly. And then when we do that, some will believe and some will believe not. But what I want you to see simply is this, Acts 17, Acts 28. Was there a believing remnant in Israel? Yeah, there, there, there very clearly was. Go back to Romans 11, verse 5. At this present time also, just like in Elijah's time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So the remnant exists due to God's election, God's choice to exercise grace. God made the decision to save people by grace. That Again, that is not God choosing individuals to get saved or not saved. That's up to them. But God made a choice to save people by grace is what that is referring to. Look with me at Romans 11, verse 6. And, and this verse is going to make it even more clear. And this is something we absolutely need to understand if we're going to understand grace today. And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. 
what Romans 11, 6 says, and if by grace, then is it no more of work, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. And what that is telling you is that it's either one or the other, but it's not a combination. If it's by grace, then it's not of works. If it's by works, then it's not of grace, but it's not 50-50, it's not 75-25, it's not 99-1, it's either all grace and no works, or it's all works and no grace. That principle, my personal opinion, is one of the most important principles to get clarity on today. And the reason why I say that is in conversations with people, God saves by grace, but, but is, you use the, t the term but to contradict what you just said, right? And I'll prove it to you. Look your wife deep in the eyes and say, I love you, but. <laughs> And she will have crystal clear understanding of the English language. And if you didn't understand that but denies what came before, she'll help you get to clarity on that. <laughs> you all know this, right? So when people say God saves by grace, but they're about to deny grace. God saves by grace, but you got to live it. You just denied grace. God saves by grace, but you can lose it if it's a denial of grace. This is, this is existentially important. This is the difference between heaven and the lake of fire. So we're going to talk about this for a minute. The point of Romans eleven six 6, just to start, is this. You really have two options. You can be saved by grace or you can save by works. Those are your two options. So now let's look at this just for a minute. Romans 3, verse 20. Romans 3, verse 20. So conceptually, theoretically, being saved by works is an option. But read Romans 3:20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So Paul says in Romans eleven six, 6, you know, one of the options, but if by works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. That is an intellectually possible option. But in practice, is there anyone justified that way? No one according to that verse, right? Just look at it again, Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Is there anyone on earth that is justified by the law? And the answer is no. And it then makes the point, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So if you think you're justified by the deeds of the law, have at it. Go for it. And what will the law produce, according to that verse? The knowledge of sin. So the more that you try to justify yourself by the law, what should become increasingly clear to you moment by moment? I am absolutely failing in this effort to be justified by the law. Every day it gets worse because I just keep failing more and more. Romans 4, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. There's a fundamental difference between salvation by works and salvation by grace. At the end of the week, when you receive a paycheck, you receive the paycheck as a matter of debt. It's an obligation that the company owes to you. 
They're not giving it to you by grace. You worked for it, and now you're entitled to it. Let's read verses 4 and 5 together. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Verse 4 makes the point that works is the opposite of grace. They're different. Verse 5 makes the point that works is the opposite of faith. Well, if works is the opposite of grace and works is the opposite of faith, that tells you that grace and faith go together, doesn't it? And in fact, you're saved by grace through faith today. Get 2 Timothy 1.9. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. 2 Timothy 1, 9, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Are works and grace different? Yes, because it's not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Titus 3, verse 5. Titus 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Again, again, and again. Those verses are telling you, you can be justified by works, you can be justified by grace. It's not a combination of the two you have to pick. And by the way, can you actually be justified by works? No. So what is the only option that is available to you whatsoever? And that is justification by grace. So I'm going to give you an illustration here, and I'm going to take the pearl of great price. So you recall in the scriptures that there is a parable of the kingdom of heaven that re references the kingdom of heaven as the pearl of great price. So I'm going to take it a, a, little, bit, a, a little bit different and do something different with it, and here's what it is. So imagine there's this pearl of great price that you want, and let's say the value of it is $20 trillion, some just immense sum. It's, it's incredibly, incredibly priceless. And the owner of it says, I'll give you two options. Option one is you can just pay me for it. Just give me the 20 trillion and I'll give it to you. So option one is you can just buy it. And option two is I'll give it to you free. You can have it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to give me anything for it. I'll just give it to you. So those are the two options. Here's what man says. I'll give you a dollar for it. Now, what's the problem with saying, I'll give you a dollar for it? If the owner of it was really going to sell it, would he sell it for a dollar? If it's worth $20 trillion, would he sell it for a dollar? No. When he offered to give it away, that was a gracious gesture. It was the acknowledgement, I know there's no way you could ever earn what it takes to have this, but I'll just give it to you out of my goodness. So when man says, let me give you a dollar for it, what's really going on? What's going on is man doesn't want to say, well, you just gave that to me. Man wants to say, I deserve it. I earned it. I bought it. See, if he gives him a dollar, he can say, well, I, I paid for it. That analogy fits perfectly with how people think about grace today. Because think about this. Doesn't Scripture describe the blood of Christ as precious? If you took all the money in the world, you gathered all the gold, all the silver, all the precious stones, all the land holdings, all the stocks, everything. And you said, well, I'll 
God, I'll give that to you in exchange for the blood of Christ. What would God say? What you, what you have is nothing. Everything you have is perishable. If you acquired all the wealth of the world, let's say you somehow could do that. You acquired all the wealth of the world. What's going to happen to everything on the earth in 2 Peter 3? It's going to be incinerated. So what have you really acquired of any eternal value? And the answer is nothing. Nothing at all. What man does is when people say, God saves by grace, but you got to live it. They're offering $1 for the precious blood of Christ. That's what they're doing. Here's what I'm contributing. God saves by grace, but then I got water baptized. And that completed the righteousness that was necessary for my salvation. Do you see how that's just absolutely, utterly preposterous? Look with me at Ephesians 2, verse 8. Ephesians 2, verse 8. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 make the point multiple ways that salvation is not anything you can earn or contribute to, but you have to receive it as a gift. Ephesians 2, verse 8, For by grace, grace is unearned, unmerited favor. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Faith is believing or trusting something. You can't really boast in that. And that not of yourselves. So what does Ephesians 2 say about your resume of good works? It's worthless. It is the gift of God. Well, if it's a gift, then you didn't earn it. Verse 9, not of works. Do you see how this, these verses are saying again and again and again, it's not you? It's a gift. It's not of works. You receive it by grace through faith. Now notice the last part of this verse. We're in verse 9. Lest any man should boast. And I'm just going to submit to you that that right there is the crux of the issue. God saves by grace. He doesn't expect you to work for it. You could never earn it. The gospel is designed in a way that excludes boasting. And that, I'll suggest to you, is the offense of the cross. The offense of the cross is this. What the cross says is all those things you're proud of, all those things you boast in, I'm basically a good person. I've given to charity. I live by the golden rule. I'm kind to my fellow man. All those things that man says, look at my resume. The gospel says, that's all worthless. If you add up all those good works and you also keep track of all of your sins, are these good works enough that God says, well, <laughs> you've done such a great job, I got to let you into my heaven despite those thousands of sins. He doesn't do that. The gospel is an offense to man's self-righteousness, is what it is. Look at me at Romans 3, verse 27. Now, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, not of works, lest any man should boast. Notice with me Romans 3, 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. So let's just make, let's take that apart and make sure we get it. Faith is excluded. What principle excludes? Boasting is excluded. What principle excludes it? Not works, because works you could boast in. Boasting is excluded by the law of faith. 
So let's go back to this just for a minute. God saves by grace, but, and after the word but is where people add the thing they're going to boast in. They add the work. But according to Romans 3.27, boasting is excluded because salvation is not of works, it is of faith. So one more point and I'll move on. The man that offers the one dollar for the pearl of great price is the same as the man who says, God's grace does most of it, but you got to do your part. You got to do this or you'll lose it. You can't do that sin or you would forfeit it. That right there is the one dollar. It's the work that man wants to boast in. Let me, let me say, put it this way. If God designed the gospel so that it, instead of it being 100% grace, it was 99.9% .9 grace, and that if you just gave a dollar to the church, then God would save you, you know what would happen? The number of people that would do that would be immense. Because they would say, well, this is great. Because then all I have to do is pay this one little dollar and I get eternal salvation. And what I really want is I did it. See, I am entitled to that salvation because I paid my dollar. And what God will do, God will save the most wicked wretch on this earth, but he will not save them in their boasting. And fundamentally, it is man's self-righteousness that keeps him from being saved. The gospel is the offense of the cross. Get with me Romans 11, verse 7. Romans chapter 11 and verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. When it says Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, it's using Israel there to refer to unbelieving Israel. When it says the election hath obtained it, it's talking about believing Israel. Look with me at Romans 3. 19. Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. What the law does is designed to shut people up and it's designed to declare them guilty. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And the idea there is simply this. Anyone that lives under the law system should quickly come to the realization that they're a sinner. If you read, let's just say you read the Ten Commandments. Do you read the Ten Commandments and feel good about yourself? Well, you shouldn't. Because among the things it says is, thou shalt not bear false witness. Have you ever borne false witness? Yeah. It says, thou shalt not covet. Have you ever coveted anything? And of course, the answer is yes. You can't read the law and come away thinking, I'm good. You can't do that. Get with me Galatians 3, verse 24. Or at least you shouldn't do that. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now, Recall, when we're in Romans 3.20, what does the law give you the knowledge of? 
for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Well, if the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, what the law does is it teaches someone under the law, it says, you're a sinner. And in teaching that, what it's teaching is, if you think you can be justified by keeping the law, you can't. You need Christ. Now notice with me, get Romans 9, verse 31. Romans chapter 9 and verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness. So did Israel possess the Old Testament law? The answer to that is obviously yes. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Israel somehow, while following the law, they didn't attain to the righteousness. Why is that? Verse 32, Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. So Israel had the law, and what did they do? Well, we just got to keep it better. I'll try harder tomorrow, and I'll do better the next day after that. Does the law teach you that if you just keep trying harder, and you just keep trying harder, you're going to get it? Is that what the law teaches? No. It's the opposite of that. The law is a schoolmaster to bring people to Christ. It's like beating your head against a cement wall. After the first 12 times, what should you do? Quit, right? I'm going to try to keep the law today. I'm going to try to keep the law today. I'm going to try to keep the law today. What is the lesson you should take away? I failed, and then I failed. Then I really failed, and I failed again. You should learn the lesson I can't be justified by the law. But what Romans 9.32 says here, look at this. Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. So they just kept going and going and going and going. And in fact, didn't the Pharisees add additional provisions to the law beyond what were in the law? Was that the, was that the weakness of the Old Testament law that didn't have enough rules? It didn't have enough specifics, so man had to come along and add more. In other words, what these verses are saying is Israel missed the entire point. The entire point of the Old Testament law was to declare people guilty and therefore to abandon all hope in themselves of keeping the works of the law. It was a schoolmaster pointing them to who? Christ. That's the lesson they should have learned. Now read the end of verse 32. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Who is it that's the stumbling stone? Jesus Christ. The law was a schoolmaster pointing them to Christ, and they didn't seek it by faith. They stumbled at that stumbling stone. So what's going on here in Romans 11, verse 7? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. Israel hasn't done that. Why? Because they stumbled at that stumbling stone. They did not learn the lesson that the Old Testament law was designed to teach them. The election, believing Israel has obtained righteousness, but the rest of Israel, unbelieving Israel, were blinded, is what Romans 11 says. Look with me at Romans 11, 25. Romans 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. Now notice this, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. There's the Israel that's blinded and unbelieving, 
and then there's the remnant that is believing. So what happened is unbelieving Israel was blinded. Go back with me with Romans 11 verse 7. What then Israel, that's unbelieving Israel, hath not obtained that which he seeketh for? But the election, that's believing Israel, hath obtained it, and the rest, that's unbelieving Israel, were blinded. Get 2 Corinthians 3, verse 14. 2 Corinthians 3, 14. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. So notice verse 14 references their minds being blinded. Verse 15 references the veil being upon their heart. So the words heart and mind are used equivalently there. What it says here is when Moses is read, he's not understood because the veil is upon Israel's hearts, and that veil prevents Israel from seeing the truth. So here's what's going on. Imagine this. Moses gives the law. Israel can't keep it. Generation, generation, generation later. You know the problem today? People still think they can keep the Old Testament law. They sought it by works. The one thing that the law is designed to teach is you can't be saved by works. It's like reading a thousand page book and missing the entire point. Look at me at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Before we go to Romans 11:8, I'll make this point. What the world is full of, the world is full of different religions that each have their own system of works, that if you perform those system of works, you are now in a right relationship with God. And what that does, you can decide if this is true, this is my opinion. Satan has all of these different false religions, all of these different false gospels. And what that does is that gives man the ability to pick the one that most caters to his flesh. So search and search and search and find the one that most appeals to your prideful flesh and embrace that and now you will have comfort and assurance in this false thing that appeals to your flesh. But the whole point of the Old Testament law, which the, the whole point of it was, you can't fulfill it by works. You just can't. And what you need to do is you need to learn the lesson of humility and say, God, I am a total failure in keeping your law, and so I'm going to trust what Christ did for me, because there's nothing else I can do. There's no other viable option. And instead, what man keeps doing is running on the religious treadmill of works. And like the little hamster, he gets no closer to attaining to righteousness because it is impossible by works. Romans 11, verse 8. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Paul is quoting there Isaiah 29, verse 10. Get Isaiah 29, verse 10. So Paul's quoting Isaiah 29, verse 10. We'll look at that first. There's another verse he may be quoting. Isaiah 29 and verse 10. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. Get Deuteronomy 29, verse 4. This is the other verse that Paul might be quoting. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 
4. Deuteronomy 29, 4. Yet the Lord hath not given you an heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear unto this day. And what this is talking about here is that God has closed Israel's eyes. This is the blinding that was described in Romans 11, verse 7. And Israel's been blinded because of their unbelief. Get with me Romans 11, verse 9. We've got just a couple more things. Romans 11, verse 9. And David said, Let their trap be made a snare and a trap. Excuse me, let me read. And David said, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. He's quoting there Psalm 69, verse 22. Psalm 69, 22. Let their table become a snare before them, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it be a trap. In other words, what, what the verse is saying is that which should have been for Israel's good instead became a trap to them, and it happened because Israel followed after righteousness but sought it not by faith. Romans 11, verse 10. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see and bow down their back alway. That's quoting Psalm 69, 23. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually to shake. Now, just notice something in comparing Psalm 69, 23 and Romans 11, verse 10. So, 69, 23 says, let their eyes be darkened. Romans 11.10, let their eyes be darkened. So that's exactly the same. Psalm 69.23 says that they see not. Romans 11.10 says that they may not see. It's not verbatim, but it means the same thing. Now notice this last part. Psalm 69.23 says, and make their loins continually to shake. Romans 11.10 says, and bow down their back all way. There's a difference in phrasing there. When you compare those two things. It's giving you the following image. Psalm 69 is making clear that what this is, is this is a man bent over, bowed down the back always, and his knees knocking together in fear. Just absolute terror is the picture that's being presented. What Romans 11 is saying there is Israel receives the judgment of blindness because it stumbled at the stumbling stone of Jesus Christ. So I'll I'll close with this. What we see going on here is, is simply this. The sad, tragic reality is that the vast majority of mankind understands there's a judgment day. And what they're doing is they're assembling their list of arguments. I did A and B and C. I never hurt anyone. I'm basically a good person. I give to charity. I keep the commandments, blah, 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 blah. The reality that all men face is how many sins are there in their account? Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, Is there any man that can show up at the great white throne and say, well, God, you don't understand. Here's all these good things I've done. And my good outweighs my bad. And it just absolutely, if if you had only one sin, if you had only one, that would not meet God's standard of righteousness. The whole point of the Old Testament law, the whole point of, of what Scripture teaches is if you're trusting in your works, you will not be saved. Because your own works are insufficient. And the only way to be saved is that Christ died on the cross for your sins, paid the full price for your sin, and then resurrected. And when you have faith in what Christ did for you, God saves you at that instant. That's the only option available that works. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, thanks for this opportunity to meet together. We thank you for your holy word. We thank you that you've preserved it for us.
We pray, Lord, that we would be growing in grace and understanding. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.